Um, yeah, so we'll try to get started here, uh, but uh, I welcome lots of questions here at the end. I hope to see some. Um, so we're, we're talking about uh, testing um, RAS conditions, basically. Um, and the background here is that uh, Cray's are always been interested in testing and, um, and uh, having good RAS solutions and trying to avoid single points of failure. And, um, but we had a customer here recently, that, a really great customer that pushed us hard, really motivated us um, to fix some problems in Luster and some long-standing architectural issues. And um, they were very concerned about RAS as well. They had a comprehensive RAS uh, test plan and um, they weren't passing very many of their tests and uh, they asked us for help. And um, the, the main issue here is that Luster has um, uh, more or less a single point of failure in the, in the protocol, uh, namely um, uh, ASTs, blocking ASTs to clients can't be resent. This is, this is a long-standing architectural issue, um, dates back, uh, I'm sure, long, long to the early days of Luster. It was recognized, you know, in June 2004, this early on um, Bugzilla ticket was opened, and that uh, later turned into LU7 and LU5520. And um, uh, what we, uh, thanks to our uh, Luster support vendor, Zyrtex, we were able to try to start solving this problem, and we, what happened is we, um, so we wanted to get that patch in and, um, and add the capability to resend ASTs and, and, and test it well and pa start passing these RAS tests. Um, so uh, the goals that we had were to cover as many cases as possible, so looking at entire systems, looking at nominal operation, and then looking at failure cases, and then including secondary type failures. And what this all boils down to, um, you know, for the, for, the, for the case of the, the resending ASTs, we wanted to basically survive a long network outage or of some finite time, not an infinite amount of time. Um, but we didn't want to suffer any client evictions. So Luster's actually pretty good about maintaining coherency of the file system via evictions. And we heard in the last talk how, you know, um, you know there's some use cases like file appends that result in lock timeouts. And that's actually not the appropriate response. Um, client evictions are, um, of course, bad because uh, for one reason, okay, you're evicting a client from from the file system and they're going to lose dirty um, pages. And um, that basically, when, when customers hear that, they think, okay, that's, that's data corruption. Even if, even if they see an, um, uh, a message come out on the console, like uh, was pointed out earlier, where the, you, know, you could look at the FID, um, you know, big HPC users aren't going to track down their users and say, hey, your workflow was disrupted because you know, this part of your um, you know, data wasn't properly written out and you didn't handle it, and et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to test these cases, but we also didn't, we wanted to get these new features in without destabilizing the code base. And um, so our goal here was to, to come up with a set of tests that we could do that and then run on a regular basis so that we couldn't, so that rather we could ensure that there aren't future um, problems with these capabilities and they don't um, cause any future regressions. Um, and continue to function as, as designed. But that testing proved really problematic. Um, so Cray, at Cray, we made a really best effort to reproduce all the problems that our customers were seeing and, and to exercise these RAS tests and track down the failures that we were seeing. But in-house at Cray, we, you know, we could take some steps to um, simulate um, scale, which is where I think a lot of these problems um, are seen, you know, we would go through a test plan and we would, we would exercise um, unit tests or basic functionality and everything would check out okay. We'd give that to the customer and they'd say, hey, this thing's falling apart all over the place, what's the matter? And um, so it really, it seems that the problems seem to be associated with scale. And since we could create a little bit of fake scaling in-house, it, it, it just never seemed to be enough. Um, our systems, um, lack the kind of scale, the tens of thousands of clients, et cetera, that our customers um, are using. And um, so to, to properly kind of exposure test some of these changes, um, you know, we'd have to give, give patches to the customer and say, hey, could you, could you try this out for us? And um, give us a thumbs up 
if things look good and let us know what doesn't work. And that's not really a good long-term solution. Um, we really can't rely on customers to find all of our problems and help us fix them. Um, so we're looking at this as a call to action to kind of do a better job of testing um, resiliency type features and things like that. And especially RAS um, tests, excuse me, because they're so demanding on the customer's infrastructure. They've got to schedule um, you know, outages and things like that. And it's, it's really hard for those guys to just um, take a patch and like, you know, start pulling cables or um, you know, power, powering down servers while they're in use because um, it's so disruptive. <clears throat> so we started looking at the issues um, to try to find out, um, you know, how to properly test this stuff. And, um, you know, as I said, we, when we got the first set of patches to um, properly resend ASTs, um, we had to figure out how to make that work properly. We had, and bugs started coming out of the woodwork, literally, um, or figuratively. <laughs> And, but so we, and we didn't understand why we couldn't uh, uh, reproduce all these problems internally. So we wanted to kind of enumerate all the use cases that we could, um, uh, you know, name all the scenarios um, and try to, try to um, examine what kind of traffic could be lost, you know. So there's other types of traffic besides, you know, recent ASTs that could be lost that could result in client evictions. Um, you know, what are the behaviors? Um, you know, what's the state machine um, for PTLRPC reconnects and things like that? And so that we could, we could um, discover all the, the answers to this and, and uh, um, construct a proper test response. So Chris um, is up next. He's gonna actually walk through um, some, of the, some of the issues that we, we started looking at here um, with these questions in mind. Thanks. Hello? So, uh, yeah, where it all goes wrong. Um, so, yeah, again, the goal is to, uh, we want to survive some lost traffic, drop packets uh, without client evictions. That's pretty easy to do if you just say, well, we'll wait forever. But uh, we also want to minimize the impact on applications, so we can't wait forever. Um, so when we're looking at what sorts of things uh, come into play when, when we do lose traffic, so if, our, if an RPC is dropped, uh, clients are going to be disconnected from the servers. They're going to need to get reconnected. Uh, that packet, that message needs to be resent. Um, and we want to be able to do that without you know, we want to do it right the first time so that we don't just repeat the cycle of client disconnects, reconnects, need to resend. And uh, so, for example, if, you know, you lose a router or a remote interface uh, goes bad on you, you know, when you're, when you're resending or getting reconnected, hopefully you can avoid using those bad routes um, so that you avoid repeating this cycle. So, uh, in more detail, uh, so with router issues, um, using bad routes is a big waste of time, and uh, so it, you know you're consuming uh, interface or peer credits, uh, hogging resources. Um, so detecting bad routes uh, quickly is really important. Uh, Luster does this by utilizing a router pinger. Um, but the router pinger is kind of slow, so uh, I think the default is uh, something like two minutes to detect uh, a bad route in the worst case. And um, and uh, in the case where you have a remote interface death, uh, you need to rely on the asymmet asymmetric router failure detection, uh, which takes even longer because you have to wait for the remote interface for the router to detect that that remote interface is down, and then the clients to then, uh, via the router pinger, to, to um, have that information propagated to the client. 
So uh, at Cray, we were able to leverage uh, some known health information that we have on our high-speed network to um, kind of skirt around the router pinger. And so if uh, you have uh, 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 node health, um, if you have notifications for node health, you can kind of do this too by using LCTL to mark pe uh, the routes up or down, excuse me, the router peers up or down if you know the route is bad. Um, but in lieu of that, uh, you can tune your router ping timeouts and ping intervals, you know, trying to minimize them so that, uh, you know, when you are relying on, on that feature to detect the bad routes, you know, you want to minimize the amount of time it takes. Uh, so this is really important when clients, you know, after dropping a packet, they need to get reconnected. You don't want to waste time trying to connect through a bad route because uh, those connect RPCs are going to fail. You're going to have to resend. If your servers are in fail, failover configurations, you know, that first connect to your primary server is going to fail, and then you're going to try the backup. Well, nothing's mounted there, so you got to go back to the primary. Um, so there were, there were uh, some other issues here that, um, that would prevent clients from getting connected. Uh, for example, if they had outstanding RPCs, and uh, so some enhancements were made there um, and adopted upstream. Uh, so yeah, generally you want, uh, you know, you want to get reconnected as, as quickly as you can. Uh, of course, it's sort of a balancing act because you don't want to, you know, expend all of your L&D credits with, with reconnects. So uh, once we do get reconnected, the next thing we need to do is resend these uh, packets that have been dropped. So for bulk IO, uh, these are already resent, which is great. Uh, it works pretty well. Um, of course, if the server is in recovery, it's a little different from sort of the normal case. Um, in general, for uh, bulk I.O. RPCs, you kind of want timeouts to happen quickly so that you, again, you know, you're minimizing the, the um, performance impact on applications. Uh, you know, you don't want your clients waiting five or tens of minutes for one bulk I.O. to time out before you can, you know, start resume I.O. Uh, so we, we stumbled upon a bug with early replies where uh, clients were waiting way longer than they should be. Uh, they weren't, servers weren't honoring um, the maximum of adaptive timeout. So we fixed that, but introduced a regression like any good developer. Sorry about that. Um, and now for the AST case, uh, so there are various types of um, uh, ASTs uh, and um, with LU5520 landed, these are now being resent, which is great. There is a f little bit of fallout. Uh, these various LU tickets uh, tracked uh, some of those issues and, and I think most of them have been resolved or are on, are on set to be resolved. Uh, there were a couple issues that ended up breaking POSIX compliance, um, which are being tracked by these tickets. And uh, I believe fixes have been submitted for both of those, and so hopefully those can land soon as well. Um, and again, uh, getting clients reconnected and, uh, you know, is in a timely manner is really important here in order to allow servers to resend these ASTs successfully and uh, for clients to reply to them in a timely manner in order to avoid evictions. Um, so very much related to that is this, uh, this tunable LD element Q min is uh, the amount of time that the server is gonna wait um, before it 
a client does traffic on a lock or, or responds to a blocking callback or um, so this needs to be tuned appropriately in order to allow this resend logic to work, right? You want to make sure that the server is willing to wait long enough for uh, a client to resend or, or, or vice versa. So, uh, so the RPC timeout in general is uh, the, the, the sum of the amount of time it takes for uh, a message to propagate from client to server and the server to actually process that request. And um, so these are both uh, bounded by uh, this tunable called ATMIN, um, which is probably not appropriate. It, ideally, I think you'd have separate values for each. Um, but so in order to allow this uh, resend logic to work, you need to account for uh, you know, that initial uh, message that is lost, um, as well as for the resend. So in order to do, do that, you have this little uh, formula that kind of tells you where you want your NQ min. Now in Cray's case, we have a network that is, um, that can be quiesced, so we need to account for that as well. Um, but of course this is, you know, a best effort thing. Like I said, we can't wait forever. And, um, you know, you want, it's a balancing act between allowing this recent logic to work and also being able to detect malicious clients or bugs in, in code where clients are holding onto resources when they should release them. So uh, we'll open up LUDoc ticket to, to share what we've learned and, um, you know, feel free to ask questions when uh, Corey finishes up here. Thanks. So we we took a look at all these scenarios, knowing you know, giving the knowledge that Chris just talked about, and we wanted to come up with a set of comprehensive unit tests that kind of test all these situations, like you know, make a client um, wait a long time to uh, reconnect on purpose and things like that. But it doesn't seem like unit tests are going to cover all of our cases here. Um, so what we want to do is. Um, we want to we want to do some more uh, lots and lots of manual testing. I think that's the only way we're gonna we're gonna crack this nut. And we'll, we want to do it in a way where we're 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 raising the bar um, on what it means to pass these tests. So we're gonna do we've been doing these typical tests like everybody does you know tests fail over and fail back. Um, but what we haven't done is um, done a good job I think of looking at okay, did, did we go through our, you know, our RAS tests with, and look for client evictions? Okay, did, did all the data that they wrote out, um, you, can you verify that that's correct? So once we started doing that, we actually found some bugs in these areas. Um, and thanks to our customer, again, um, here for helping us out in, with these situations. So we're taking a look at you know, the traditional failover, failback. We're looking at the different types of router death, including the interesting case of the re remote interface um, um, issue that Chris talked about, and just taking a look, um, you know, again at a total network outage, like Chris mentioned, um, you know, Cray uh, has um, an HSN that's capable of, uh, you know, rerouting around failures, and that causes some downtime, and so um, that's a situation that can crop up on our systems quite a lot. It makes them more resilient, but it also, um, you know, exercises these uh, error paths more often. So we need to do more testing there of all these cases. And then the next step, I think, uh, or the, what we're starting to do is, okay, so we're gonna combine failover testing with, um, you know, a router goes down in the middle of that, make sure that that all works well. And that's, you know, slowly gonna raise the bar, I think, on, on the capabilities of, of Lustre. Um, but we, we need to take some further steps. We need to do, I think, um, even um, more testing and let, raise the level of difficulty again um, so we're looking at uh, trying to really create all those situations that the things that can go wrong, and there's there's obviously there's lots of them, and so we're going to have a hard time um, targeting each one one by one. That's why I think it's the unit test approach is is needed, but not enough. 
Um, so one of the capabilities that exists now, through, of course, through failure injection, is to drop a certain amount of traffic. And so if we incorporate this into a regular workload testing and then do those things like always check for data ver verification and client evictions and so on, that we can be assured that we're dropping enough of the traffic at some time that and continuously test that we can feel good about the, the capabilities and the infrastructure of Lustre. And so I, I'm encouraging the community to adopt this kind of test for um, you know, the, you know, the synthetic workload tests that are part of the release process. Um, and then additionally, um, we're working on an NRS policy to simulate high server load. So this is an idea that Chris had I thought was really good because um, we've had a lot of problems um, that um, you know, some of the LU tickets that you shot before that, that precipitated or it was fallout from um, having the, the resend logic in for ASTs that disrupted the PTLRPC state machine recovery that we found, found problems in adaptive timeouts. And that's um, by delaying server side um, processing, we can sort of simulate those effects. And, um, and I think that we need to pull that into our test bag of tricks as well. Um, but we need to be a little more careful about that because if we delay things too long, then, then there will be client evictions, but there ought to be client evictions in those cases, right? So um, we can't just throw a regular workload and, and run that kind of test and then not be too careful about checking the results. So that's a little bit tricky. And then, um, you know, I mentioned keeping clients from reconnecting, but so another tactic that we could use there is to use the imperative recovery feature to force clients to reconnect to the wrong failover partner, say for instance, and that would in introduce some latency in the whole um, recovery process. And so what we want to do is take everything that we've learned and kind of roll it up into a big test plan and use combinations of, of the above. So drop a certain percent of traffic during um, you know, a failover. Um, we ought to be able to recover from that, but will we? Um, and, and things like that. Um, so I've left a bunch of time here at the end. Um, so uh, you know, just for reference, um, here's some um, some of the bugs that we you know we've been taking a look at, and um, you guys can go take a look at this later. Um, but I want to give a special thanks to Zyrotex for helping us with the um, with the AST resend. Um, I think Vitaly Fertman was uh, instrumental in that. It's unfortunate that he he's not here today, but I I just want to thank the Zyrotex staff for that. And I left a bunch of time for questions. Uh, I was hoping um, we would get some good questions and maybe talk about what, what uh, the community can do as a whole to take this kind of work forward, it, um, maybe with the OFS and OpenFS. Oh, excuse me, OpenSFS. Thank you. Merci. Regarding the manual testing, which you have covered many cases, when this node goes down or something, you said you have to do a lot of manual testing for figuring out the failure mechanisms. So is it possible to build a simulator rather than you know doing it manually, looking at different, different cases? I understand all the failure cases may not be handled by simulator, but I think some of them, is it, is it possible, I'm just thinking aloud with you, to build a simulator which can uh, take care of, uh, of this manual testing and reduce the time for the testing purpose? Yes, it is possible. Um, one, one of the difficulties that we have is that we want to test the whole stack. Um, and um, for, uh, for um, folks that are using LNET routers, that, that can be kind of problematic because we want to um, bridge different kinds of networks, not all of which can be put into a simulated or a virtual environment. Um, I heard some encouraging test results from guys that were um, using um, uh, you know, a virtual InfiniBan device so that they could still use the O2 IB L&D. Um, but I think most of the virtual testing would kind of have to be in the SOC, SOC L&D department. And that, that doesn't give us kind of the code coverage that we want to see. But that's an excellent suggestion. Other questions? Yeah. OK, this is going to be the last one. So in your talk, you mentioned uh, dropping a certain percentage of message. And actually, at, at Intel, we have been doing those tests for a couple of weeks already. We have some um, patches that can run on the router. 
that drops, we can inject holes, which allow you to drop messages, one out of 100, one out of 1,000 messages, and so on. Yeah, we, I think you know, we picked this up from you guys. Oh, okay. uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Um, but, the, but the NRS policy is something that uh, hasn't been written yet. Um, so okay. we're, we're starting to, de to design that now. Um, and we'd like to get that out there so that we can get some experience with it and find out how we can use it to test. Um, in combination um, with the failure injection uh, okay. to, for drop packets, absolutely. Um, we just have to f get that done and get that out there. Thank you. There's uh, another question, if we have time. Uh, we're, we're out of time? Okay. Sorry. Thanks. I'll catch you during the break.